Sure. All right. <laughs> Welcome to um, our Polar Week uh, live event. We're very excited to be offering and hosting this event. Um, we just, Polar Week just started yesterday. Um, the first event that we got going on, our this first webinar, is Making Broader Impacts in Polar Science. And we have, um, this is being uh, presented by Polar Educators International, and we have several presenters who will introduce themselves here in a little bit as to who they are and what the purpose of this uh, webinar is all about. But if you're new to um, using um, this platform, this is called Blackboard Collaborate, and there's a few things that you need to know about how to use it before we go much further. The slides should be changing on the screen for you, and there's a, um, a list of participants um, on the left-hand side of the screen, so you can see who's joined us. Below the list of the participants is a chat area, so some people have already been using that. That's a great place to um, ask questions, or when we ask you to introduce yourselves, you can type in the information there. And um, if you have another question that you want to ask live as you go along, you can click the little hand icon above the list of participants, and that's like raising your hand and lets us know that you want to uh, say something. For this event, we aren't using uh, video, so no one will have video. And um, if you do have, want to talk live and are called on, you will need to click on the talk button once to open up the mic and click on the talk button when you are done um, to shut the mic, and then you won't get feedback um, or uh, cause a nice echoing sound. So um, here's a uh, slide that talks about questions. Again, we'll have time at the end of the presentation for people to ask live, and as we go along during the presentation, just type them in the chat box. Um, this event is archived, and we'll post it on our website as well as I'm sure Apex will have a link to it and other things that are associated with the Polar Week. Um, and I think that's it for our little slides. The next one is um, about what is Polar Week, and I'll let Sarah take it from here. All right, great. This is Sarah. I work with GIS here at Arcus uh, in Fairbanks, Alaska. And it is Polar Week, and so all this week we're celebrating everything polar. It's because of the equinox right now, so that each of the polar regions, the Arctic and the Antarctic, are getting 12 hours of daylight, an equal amount of light. And uh, happening twice each year, and so we'll have Polar Week again in March. So it was a great success last March, and doing pretty well already in September. And they're partnering organizations with APEX, the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists. Um, we're partnering with them and with Polar Educators International. So lots of great stuff, and the website is there to see what else there is, and we'll talk more about what's available for Polar Week. So we're going to into the presentation here just to mention a little bit about PEI, or Polar Educators International. It's a global professional development network for those that educate in, for, and about the polar regions. So right now we're a, a fledgling organization that's working on building um, our mission and vision and figuring out who we are as a group and what we want to do to move forward. But one of the biggest things coming out of the International Polar Year meeting in Montreal was that we wanted to start getting involved right away. So this is one of the first activities that PEI has been a part of as an organization. So cheers to our Polar Week committee for uh, getting this presentation taken care of. If you want to become part of Polar Educators International, right now our biggest uh, presence is on Facebook, and that's where we're all talking with each other. Um, but we have about 200 or so, 250 members with emails going out, and we're working on um, uh, taking our next steps in the next couple of months. So there's a couple of different ways to join us, Facebook, LinkedIn, and on Twitter. So that's a little bit about Polar Educators International. You can let us know if you have any questions later on. But I'm going to turn it over to Brandon Gillette. So Brandon, you're welcome to start. Oh, and it's All right, thanks, Sarah. Um, again, my name is Brandon Gillette. And currently, I am a graduate research assistant at the uh, Center for Remote Sensing of Ice Sheets, or CRESIS, headquartered at the University of Kansas in Lawrence. And just a very brief background, um, 
got both my degrees previously here at Kansas and then went and taught middle and high school science for five years. And in teaching AP environmental science, decided I wanted to come back to the classroom, and, or back to the classroom, back to school, and uh, study polar science, um, also stemming from an experience of polar trek teachers. Um, I've been to Antarctica three times now, and uh, I'm going to kind of be talking very briefly about the importance of researchers doing outreach to classrooms. Um, and so the next slide. Uh, has kind of an interesting graphic. Uh, I think these are called memes, depending on where you look at them. Um, most of you have probably seen one or more of these in some capacity or another. Of, you know, you put in a job description: uh, scientist, meteorologist, teacher, you know, grad student is always a, a favorite one of mine. Of what people think you do. And so I'll kind of give you a second to take a look at this. Uh, you know, what mom thinks you do, friends, what society thinks you do. That's just one of my favorite pictures. Uh, and then what you really do. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, as a grad student, OK, I have piles on my desk. They're probably not quite that tall, but um, that's OK. Um, so that just kind of gives you an idea. Hey, Brandon. Yes. You're, you're cutting out a little bit. It's hard to hear you all the way. So um, why don't you, uh, I don't know, if you're too close to your mic or not facing your mic or something, but oh. the Presbyterian. You know what I, I found out? Um, it looks like my talk timed out on me uh, for some reason. I'm not sure. I don't think I clicked anything, but I could have. Um, OK, so uh, I think we've taken enough time to. Uh, have a good laugh at this picture here. Um, so the only other thing um, that I really kind of want to focus on, I've got some quotes on here. Um, and I, I'll, I'll kind of read these just to kind of put a little emphasis on some pieces. Um, these were actually taken from another presentation that uh, Polar Educators International uh, had, so I can't claim credit. Um, I guess I would have to quote Andy Goodman here. Um, even if you have reams of evidence on your side, remember numbers numb, jargon jars, and nobody ever marched on Washington because of a pie chart. Um, and so one of the things that we really try and do is to get scientists out in the field to tell a story. Um, as classroom teachers, you hear lots of, oh, we need to use data in the classroom. We need to use real experiences from the field and, and that sort of thing. But you know, when students just see all the data, you know, they're like, OK, well, what's the point? Um, not to mention that there's tons and tons of data out there to begin with. You, you really start to wonder what impact this is going to have on a student. And so uh, one of the biggest messages to take away from this part is when collaborating with, with scientists um, in general is, you know, get them to make this personal for the students. You know, most kids are probably never going to go to Antarctica or to Greenland or, in some cases, Alaska or, or anywhere else like that. And so by making it personal to them in some fashion or another, I think you can really uh, help to bridge the gap between uh, the science that's being done and what your students can actually take away from it. So I'll leave you with one more quote. Um, we don't need more information. Uh, this again goes back to the fact that we have tons and tons of data, and more often than not, it's not that we don't have the data, it's that we don't really know what to do with it. Uh, so continuing, we need to know what it means. We need a story that explains what it means and makes us feel like we fit in there somewhere. So unless anybody has questions for me, I think my biggest point was to really just kind of uh, get out there that you know, scientists going to the classroom and interacting with students is a very important part of what it is that we're trying to do. Um, and if people do have questions, my contact information, uh, I can certainly pass that out. Um, but if you have other questions, feel free to pass those along as well. All right. Thank you, Brandon. All right, yeah, so just a reminder, if you have questions as you go along, you can type them in, and then we'll answer them also at the end. So next up is Julia Dooley. Hello, everyone. I'm Julia Dooley. I am a school teacher in public school. Actually, I teach in Delaware. I've been in elementary schools. I started out teaching sixth grade, worked into fifth grade. And actually, for the last few years, I've been teaching gifted and talented students at the elementary level. 
I was a teacher uh, with the Andro Project in Antarctica, so I'd been down in Antarctica for a little over two months in 2007. Um, still do outreach projects with them, and yeah, do all kinds of things. Any time I can pull in polar science, I do. Um, so I'm actually talking mostly to the scientists that are online with us today and talking about how to get into school. So if you want to pull up my first slide. Um, and I think teachers, I'm speaking for everybody perhaps, but um, we're very adept at getting people into the classroom and pulling in all kinds of interesting people. So I'm guessing you probably have been approached already by a teacher that you know about making a presentation in a school. But if not, um, here's some advice perhaps. Um, pairing up with a teacher that you know already is great. But if you don't know of somebody, a great way to get started is to contact your local school district where you live or where you've been doing your research or where you're stationed right now. Um, give them a call or check up their website and they would have probably a science page on there and a contact person. The science content chair might be a good person to work with. Or if you um, contact the local school and ask them who's in charge of the science program at the school and kind of start with there. Um, it's best to plan ahead. We teachers all have calendars that we have to follow and curriculum that needs to be addressed at a particular time. So making sure that your science lines up with what's happening in the regular classroom is certainly a great way to get in there. And I'm not just talking about science either. I know in our anthologies that we use for um, language arts and uh, reading, there are many, many stories about penguins or polar researchers or um, the history of polar exploration. Um, so you can also tie in that way too. Um, and there again, your teachers can certainly help you what's going on at what time. One thing that I've had to deal with recently are security issues, which um, it's a sad but true reality. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It, um, yeah, okay, I'm looking at the wrong slide on the wrong computer screen. Um, so if, uh, I have a, a guest speaker that's coming, and I actually have to make them or have them sign um, or give us information and make sure that they have had a, a don't have a criminal background, so it's a background check. You don't have to do fingerprinting or anything like that, but there is paperwork that has to be submitted in my school district and then approved before anybody can come in and talk with students. Um, I don't know if other schools are experiencing the same kind of a thing, but uh, that's what we have to do. If not, there's usually if you're coming to a school, you have to make sure that you sign in someplace or um, Sometimes you have to make sure you bring your ID. So just be prepared for that. Don't be insulted. Don't think people are questioning who you are. It's just something that happens now. Um, another thing that helps if you are working in a school is tool. I, I don't like to address this thing either. The um, state, national standards, everything has to go by the standards. But actually, I think a lot of the science that everybody's involved in would be in the content science standards someplace. So it's just a matter of kind of addressing that, which makes the teacher's job much easier to be able to get you into the schools to talk with the students. <laughs> um, okay, so next slide. So actually, there are many other communities that would love to have te or, yeah, teachers working in polar science, but also scientists come in and talk with them. Senior centers is an often overlooked um, area. There are many places where seniors are and they, they are still active in their minds and they, they love to be involved in all kinds of things and hear what everybody's doing. Um, I've actually gone in also, my parents are uh, with the Academy of Lifelong Learning at the University of Delaware. So they have programs too where they, they go and take classes actually. So pairing up and finding somebody who's doing some kind of a program where you could probably come in and talk with them, they love that. Um, Libraries are also good. Libraries, nature centers, small nature centers, and local parks or community parks or state parks even. Um, love to have people come in and do presentations. When I was working for one of the, our local nature centers, they called our big harvest festival. It was not a fundraiser, but it was a friend raiser. So anything that gets people in the door to come and, and use the facility and Libraries are hurting. They, they would love to get patrons in to come and check out more books. 4-H um, clubs are good, working with students. Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, 
So a lot of the badges that kids are earning with scouts um, actually might have something to do with polar sciences. Uh, boys and girls clubs. But the one thing I would say about boys and girls clubs is that um, many of the programs there, you're talking to kids who have been tired out going to school anyway. So if you want to think more about, instead of doing a talk, plan some kind of an activity where they can get involved, get up and moving, or try and make some kind of a game out of a particular science topic that you're working with. Um, yeah, the one thing I would say, though, if you're doing Boys and Girls Clubs or maybe Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, don't be afraid to establish boundaries with kids, um, you know, having a few rules. Um, to help them focus on what you're talking about instead of kind of like a massive free throw. <laughs> um, okay, next slide. Okay, so advice about presenting to students. Um, I can't stress enough knowing your audience and modifying your presentation accordingly is pretty huge. Um, and the one thing I I would suggest to I had an Apex um, scientist come in and talk recently and. She sent her PowerPoint slide that she had used in Montreal and kind of wanted to use some of those slides. Um, but I was trying to say, you probably don't want to do that. Maybe pick out a few slides that pertain to the key points that you want to talk about and kind of work from there. So that's the biggest thing that I can recommend. Um, so these other points on here I have in other slides. Um, let's see, go ahead and move to the next slide. So knowing your audience, I wanted to put up too, if you're going to present a graph, the bottom graph is actually a, a graph that I've seen in a presentation at the school. But the students that you're talking to might have no clue what they're looking at because the graphing that they use, if you look at the top one, that's from a third grade math program. And these are taken from my gifted education material. So they might even be needing to um, yeah, anyway, that's where they're coming from anyway, if that helps you. So third graders or eight-year-olds are um, at the point where they're making a bar graph. And if you will notice the big thing about graphs with elementary school kids, the zero point is always, it seems, at the bottom left of the graph, which is not necessarily the case with scientific presentation and things. So then the middle graph is a fifth grader's line graph. And you can see they're starting to use like um, a line connecting points and maybe looking at two pieces of information. So again, if you're going to show them this uh, graph down below where you're um, trying to look for a correlation between one thing and another thing, you are going to have to point that out. And one thing I would recommend is always showing the students, have them look at the graph first and, and make them think about it, but then talk about the key points of it and have them find where is zero on the graph. I think that would be a great question to start out with. Um, and then, of course, in this graph in particular, you want them to look at the correlation, how the blue line responds to the red line or the red line responds to the blue line and how they kind of follow each other. So even breaking it down like that would be um, very, very helpful for them. But then I'm also thinking, too, if you are talking to an older generation of people, um, they are probably going to be able to handle that kind of information. And, but the other thing I was going to mention, too, is you're talking to a senior group. I actually did a, a talk at um, Academy of Lifelong Learning, and half of my audience fell asleep partway through. <laughs> and it, it's not because they're bored. It's not that they're not interested. It's just that they tend to fall asleep when the lights go down. So consider that. That's part of knowing your audience. OK, next slide. Um, using explicit vocabulary is a big thing in the schools. Um, don't be afraid of using big words, but kind of focus on word keywords that are going to keep with the key point of your message. Um, kids like interesting words. If you give it to them in a way that they understand what you're talking about, and then if you have them use it, it would be pretty cool too. So I just put up biostratigraphy definition. You know, if you kind of just go give them a definition like this, they are not listening at all. But if you break it into bio, life, strata, layers, and graphy <laughs> um, diagramming or something, and then provide a picture for them, they, they will get what you're talking about. They might not remember the word, but at least they've been exposed to it, and it does kind of help them. OK, go ahead. Next slide. 
Okay, focusing on your key points, and I think Brandon touched on this too, don't bury them in all kinds of stuff because it's just too much. Um, you want to stick with this main points, and I said if you, that you calibrated your instruments is important, but it's not that interesting, so you know, don't include every single detail. Um, adding some personal interest stories, as Brandon also said, it helps make the science accessible. Um, and also t touches on that, well, you could be a scientist too. And um, this is something that I've, this is where I started out from. I, I said that would be a good thing to talk about. How did you get involved in your topic? What made it interesting to you? Um, and yeah, we've, in polar places, you end up with polar bears and penguins, and we've all got those cute little pictures. And I'm not saying don't include those in a presentation, but also don't be surprised if you lose part of your audience as far as what your message is and they get hung up on the, the penguin polar bear thing, unless that is your science, then of course you would want to talk about that more. <laughs> so I put in some pictures of things that you could think about that kids would also think is cool on the, up at the top picture, how to live in a polar place and what it's like to be there in those boxes out there in my freezer for the food when I was there or trucks. Kids love trucks and equipment. They think it's really neat and cool and you can talk about how the piston bullies top speed is 16 miles an hour or something. Um, and of course the Mount Erebus volcano. So volcanoes are always cool too. So think about including those things. Okay, I think that's next slide. Am I finished? Yeah, thank you Julia. All right, thanks so much. And we're going to turn it over to Janet Nadeau. So are you ready? All right, All right. Janet, we're going to turn it There you go. How's that? Is that a good volume? Perfect. Okay, um, I'm calling in from Ottawa, Canada, and I'm really thrilled to be part of this. And I hope that on the next uh, two slides, everybody will find some kind of links that they'll be able to use quickly and easily in the classroom. Because we don't have time and it's just not physically possible to, to bring an actual researcher into the classroom. So if you go to the next slide, please, Sarah. Right. Um, these are different ways that um, you can get help with bringing polar science into the classroom. Um, there are teachers that are involved in polar science that will be more than happy to send you information. There are, there are young people out in the field right now that are willing and eager to uh, send videos, send, um, send anything uh, over the internet to you to help uh, with your classroom. I've also sent a, a few links that show how different industries are also willing, willing to help us within the classroom. Uh, people in universities, if you have a university near you, great, then uh, uh, contact them and see if there's some way that they could make a presentation into your class because as exciting as we think we are, they re kids really love to have guest speakers. Um, Sarah, I don't know if you can click on any of those links. Can you? No, no not at this OK, time. so um, I've tried them all out. And uh, they will link you with either um, um, a database where you can uh, uh, get through to to educators where you can get some um, actual lessons or um, to uh, I, the first one, EcoSchools, um, is one that I use here. I'm actually part of that. It, if you are able to click on that, you will see how teachers are actually helping other teachers uh, green their schools. And uh, it's a whole process that um, if you click on any of these links, I'd be more than happy if you have questions for you to email me, and I ha I'd be happy to work with you on that. Um, next slide, please. Um, Facebook. If you're not already on Facebook, you should get on Facebook. Um, there's, there's even a, the teachers, the administrators at our school were 
were really looking down on Facebook, but um, and now they've actually developed a site called uh, FacebookTeachers.com. So there's not, I don't know if that was, um, you know, why they changed their minds so fast. Maybe better to be part of it than away from it. But um, with Facebook, you can um, access the, the scientist sites of Apex. You can uh, um, access fellow PEI teachers. And you can also get information in, uh, you'll find people that speak a lot of different languages. So I guess that's it, unless there are any questions. Perfect. Perfect. That sounds like it. All right. Thanks, Janet. And we're going to turn it over to Linda here to talk a little bit about uh, yeah, where to go from here, other types of collaboration. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to Polar Week. It's pretty exciting. Um, it's exciting to be here. Um, my name is Linda Lamaru, and I am here in Kingston, Ontario, speaking to you. I'm an elementary teacher. I've been in the classroom for almost 20 years now, and I'm also an education outreach coordinator for a group of scientists that work on Cape Bounty, which is um, a project that's happening on Melville Island located in the high Arctic. So looking at researcher-teacher collaborations, is, is it's something that I do. It's something I do a lot. Um, it's important to have researchers come into our classrooms and to have our students interacting in research environments such as labs, study areas, and places of research, so where you get your work done. Um, there's a quote here I have from Bernice Rimla of Rockefeller University. And she says, it only takes a single classroom visit, one day of students interacting with a scientist or visiting a lab to change their mindset, making science less scary and more attainable to them, the child. So how can we make this happen? Um, I've, I've been able to have some um, really interesting experiences. I, um, from 2007 to 2011, I had a unique and awesome, it was an amazing experience to work with this group of International Polar Year researchers by bringing their research and their experiments to elementary age children in Nunavut, uh, especially Resolute Bay at the school there. Um, I would take researchers up into, into the school um, I would then um, help the researchers present the hands-on activities and show the children what's happening on Melville Island that's not that far from their home. So basically bringing science to the children and showing them what's happening around. Um, the children were excited to have a scientist from the South visiting them. And when I returned the following year, I was actually greeted by a group of children. And there was one boy who said, hey, are you that teacher that brings scientists into our school? Did you bring another scientist to, to us? Because I need to know. And right there is where I realized that one scientist in one school for even one day, and the result is children talk about science. So now you down here in the south don't need to go to the poles for this type of experience to happen. You just need to bring a polar scientist to you. And this is how you can do it. Uh, could I get the next slide? Thanks. Um, if you're a teacher, you can start uh, by celebrating Polar Week, which is happening this week. And you could also um, go to Earth Science Week, which is happening October 4th to 20th. And the American Geoscience Institute in the US and museums and, univer and universities throughout North America and Australia have information kits to help you get going on this. Um, so here is uh, the website for that. I think this will work. There we go. Um, other things, if, if you're wanting to go big, plan a science week in your school. Bring in scientists, community members to engage your students in science and math. Um, ways that this can be done is um, contact your universities, as Janet was saying before. Um, go into um, different community events and make yourself known. 
it really helps. Um, if you're a researcher and you want to become involved in the community, you could be adopted by a school. I've seen this happen. It's fantastic. Um, find a school that is in a community near you, uh, maybe one that you live in, and go to the school, visit the principal, um, tell them that you would like to be involved within the school, and they can help you get that get started on that. They will welcome you. Um, schools love to have researchers come in, and it's great for the kids if you also can be there more than just once. Um, you develop a relationship with, with, with the children, and it is fantastic. Uh, next slide, thanks. Okay. Um, and as a grade five, six teacher, I'm always looking for unique experiences for my students. When planning new units, um, I plan to have at least one visitor in the classroom to bring the subject to life. And I try to go on a field trip. I call them I would field trip out to explore. Maybe just down to the park. Maybe um, we get on a bus and go somewhere else. Um, to make these field trip outs successful, make connections. Um, as Janet and um, was saying, there's local libraries that you can do it at, universities, local museums. Um, I've been known to even call a museum on the other side of the country and ask them if they know of anybody in my area who can come into the classroom. Okay. Um, other things that you can do, you can invite um, your APEX members. So one way to do this is to see the cool speakers list um, or even the Facebook site. Make a connection there. Uh, another way to do it is to Skype chat. There's a lot of things that happen. Um, in and around science and research, um, there's people here I know that are, are in this in sharing on this on this site today that um, have done Skype chats and have brought researchers into the classroom through Skype chats. So go to the PEI Facebook and just ask a question. It's a good way to to find the information. Okay. Um, so and inviting your scientists, researchers, grad students to become judges at local science fairs. Um, if you're do, participating in a science fair, maybe bring a couple grad students into your classroom just to talk about science fair and why they do science. It's a great idea. Um, I think that's it for my slides. Am I right? Or is there one? No, there's one more. Other ideas. Um, Scientific America has a thousand scientists in a thousand day program. So if you are a scientist, please join this. Um, this is happening in the US. It's a great thing to do. Um, if you're in Canada, the Calgary Science Network matches the science scientists and classrooms, students in the classrooms. Um, and the other one is um, for Ontario and Alberta. Scientists in the school um, has programs where students in the schools become scientists. And the website that is there for that. And scientists in the school is actually looking at celebrating their one or their five millionth student scientist in the school this year. So that's a that's a good thing to do as well. So I would encourage everyone to Start sharing your collaboration ideas on the PEI Facebook page. Ask questions if you if you are looking for answers, because um, it's it's how we can make this start. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Linda. Perfect. Um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit. This is Sarah Crowley uh, from ARCUS once again and on the steering committee with Polar Educators International. And I wanted to just mention a way that people can get involved right away this week with Polar Science and, um, and PEI. So this activity was chosen by the folks that you just talked to. Um, they, we had many submissions of wonderful resources and activities for Polar Week, and we wanted to choose one that was the global activity. We hoped that um, most classrooms around the world and, and science labs and whomever else would want to participate in doing this. It's called Flakes, Blobs, and Bubbles, an Ice Core Art Project. You can find it at icecoreart.weebly.com. So just to give you an idea of what this activity is so that you have some background when you go to do it, it's the science of ice. Um, so Heidi Roop designed this project, and uh, she looks at ice cores, and she's living in New Zealand right now. 
and it's talking about a little bit about how ice sheets form and how scientists use them to look at past climate. So to make the long story short, the science of the activity can be taught as you talk a little bit about snow, about fern, which is sort of when snow becomes closer to ice as, it, as the weight and pressure is building, and then the ice that turns into a glacier. So um, all of these pieces have different, they look different as well as have different components to them. One of the most important, important parts is that um, in between the snowflakes and the granules of ice, there are uh, particulates that are trapped, so greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane, and so they're trapped within the ice, and they're left there over time as these layers throughout the years. And when Heidi and other scientists um, drill for ice cores, they can take a look and figure out what the different signatures of these particles or um, gases are, and it helps to give us an idea of what the climate has looked like over hundreds of thousands of years. So it's a really important um, source of information for scientists to give us some information about climate or paleoclimate. So you can add a little bit of science there in your classes. Uh, you may already be talking about the polar regions this week, but this is just a great uh, extension into art. So how could you start to draw snowflakes, fern, and ice? Again, snowflakes, they come in all different shapes and sizes. Fern is the picturized flakes of snow that are beginning to become granules, and then you have ice that has the trapped gases in it. So you ask your students, what do you think they each look like, or the people in your office or people in your lab, and give them a chance to draw these out. So it's pretty easy. You can have people draw three images if you want, or just one of representing the different types of uh, uh, components of, of ice or the uh, ice cores. It's important that we use blue ink only. And when you're done, you can submit your ice core art to icecoreart at gmail.com. Um, all of these pieces of, of artwork are up there now, and it's pretty neat what we're seeing, so I'll show you a picture in a second. But as they're compiled, the point is to form a global ice core. Uh, they're going to be graded in a, a computer program by color and density to simulate the creation of ice from snow. The mosaic will be used to create different images with student art and be available worldwide. Um, it will be available on the APEX website in the future, so keep posting your photos to that Gmail address this week. And next week it will still be available, of course. And um, uh, composites, we're hoping that we can take some images and create the composites of ice cores, the global ice core by the end of Polar Week. So we'll need to have lots of submissions to be able to do that. So we want to see what you can bring to the table. Here's some pictures of what's been submitted already. So a couple of classrooms are starting to submit. The one on the right is from a group of third graders, and the one on the left is from, uh, I believe, middle school and high school students. So it's a pretty neat gallery to look at if you want to get an idea of what's out there. And just contribute one or two pictures for yourself would be great. So that's a little bit about the global activity that we're hoping that many classrooms and communities around the world are doing. And to give you another idea of what's going on with Polar Week beyond uh, the global activity, is there's going to be more webinars. We have one tomorrow morning here in Alaska, and um, it's geared towards European students and classrooms. And it's on uh, connecting to the poles. So how is it that um, young researchers got involved in the polar region? Another one is on Thursday, and that will be geared towards American students and time zones. There are lots of lessons and activities available. The website for all of these is still down below there. Um, you can ask a scientist. This week there are 40 scientists standing by waiting for questions from students, and you can reach them on the APEX website as well. You can launch a virtual balloon and let us know you're participating in Polar Week. Also, uh, Joel Heath is online here with us. He's been working really hard to help create the release of uh, People of a Feather, a film, an award-winning film that's been shown. And there's an educational version of this film being released for International Polar Week. And proceeds supporting the charitable activities of the Arctic Eider Society. The people of a feather takes you through time into a unique world, the new
So please take a look at that and the website's there. Um, and he wanted to make sure he could get that link out to you um, right away. Also, just keep on the horizon that Antarctica Day is coming up in December. So there will be lots more to learn about there. So that's basically all that we had we wanted to share with you about Polar Week and how you can get teachers and researchers working together and have researchers working with students and communities around the world. So at this time, if there are any questions, we'll turn it over to you. Um, so go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question. You're welcome to. And if not, you can type it into the chat box if you have any questions. See a few people typing away there. And if any of the presenters have anything else they want to add, you're welcome to. But I really appreciate all the work that uh, the Polar Week Committee has put into the presentations as well as choosing the flagship activity or group activity. Perfect. So Joel was just sharing that the, um, oh, wow. the link was just released. Perfect. Yeah, with lesson plans. Cool. And Janet was wondering where everyone in the room is listening from. So people have been typing about where they're from. Um, I know we've got people from the U.S., Canada, France, uh, Russia, um, and the U.K. earlier. I know that at least. Yeah, we've got lots of people all over the place. Perfect. Any questions about working in classrooms or? As a scientist getting to the classroom. You have your experts here. So if you want to ask your question live, just click on the little hand icon. It's okay to talk. <laughs> Sometimes it's faster. All right, looks like there's a question about getting a, uh, a short video about the Canadian Arctic. Any of the presenters want to comment on that? Joel, do you want to mention how your video has anything to do with the Canadian Arctic? Yeah, sure. I can just give you an update. Uh, we have uh, five different lesson plans that are related to the content of the film, and they deal with kind of the different parts of it. So some of it is uh, kind of going beyond what was made in the film, learning about plinia and flow edge habitats and the different sorts of research techniques that we use in those habitats. Um, the second lesson plan is about hydroelectricity and how it affects sea ice and thinking about working, trying to find solutions and like thinking about the energy demands in your community and what time of year they peak and how things might be coordinated. And then we have one done Inuit ingenuity and culture and thinking about technology and how it's changed over time. And those lesson plans on the IDER that are directly linked to a lot of the research that we've done up there for the last 10 years. And so students can look at the underwater video, they can think about how that video was used to generate data and there's graphs and they're showing the analysis that was done on the data and students can kind of bring that together to understand how IDAs get through winter in the Arctic and why that's important. And then there's even one on filmmaking thinking about how to capture culture on film and relating uh, the story of people over the feather to the story of Nanook of the North which was done pretty much 100 years ago and Flaherty actually started on the same islands. So um, yeah, all those are linked to curriculum. Um, both in Canada and the States, and uh, so yeah, we're, we're really excited to be able to have this out there. And there's both a 52-minute and a 90-minute version of the film included with a license to be able to show it in classrooms and stuff. So uh, we've been working hard and finally have it ready ready for the public. Great. Sounds good. Yeah. Looks like Janet, do you want to um, say something? You've got your hand up. Uh, We'll hit the talk button one more time so we can hear you. Can you hear me now? There. How's that? Great. Great. 
Okay, thanks. I just wanted to remind people that if um, if you Google ArcticNet or Schools on Board, there are some videos on YouTube there. Perfect. Thanks, Janet. I was thinking too in Montreal somebody had mentioned their um, Canadian Film Board had a collection of videos they presented, but I don't have the information right in front of me. Thanks, Julia. I can uh, I can look for that if you like and send it to you. Yeah, I think it was Brittany Potter that was asking the question. You can send it to me and I'll send it out if you'd like. Okay. Good. All right. Well, I think we'll kind of leave it at that for now. I really appreciate everybody tuning in to learn a little bit more on how to get involved with researchers, bringing them into the classrooms and researchers to get a good idea of what it's like to head into classrooms and communities. So we want to thank Arcus, Apex, and um, PEI as the sponsors for Polar Week and this webinar. And we hope you have a good rest of your Polar Week. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, everybody.